<laughs> well, welcome to the sixth international uh, conference on depression, anxiety, and uh, stress management. We're glad that you're here. We want to have uh, this to be interactive. We want it to be fun. We hopefully will all learn something that we can take back to our communities, to our practices, to our families, to our friends, to make this world a little better place in whatever sphere of influence that we have. So with that, I'd like to introduce our chair for this uh, session, Dr. Pat Guire, um, who he and I have had the pleasure of actually speaking together in New York and Paris last year, which we had uh, two amazing conferences and glad to reunite here in London. He's from here, I'm uh, all the way from uh, the US, but uh, glad to be here as well. And uh, let me uh, read uh, a little bit about Dr. Pat. Um, He's a world-leading expert in well-being, happiness, and success. His uh, in integrative approach combines applied psychology and the work of John Maxwell, uh, who's one of the leading authorities and experts on leadership and personal growth. Upon completing his PhD, he worked as a researcher for uh, a UK law enforcement agency and taught at several universities. Uh, in 2006, he completed his second uh, doctorate in clinical psychology. Um, and he's also, I do need to disclose this, he's also a, a partner. Uh, together we're, we work at the Happiness Center. I have uh, the US side and he has UK and, uh, and, and Europe. So if you're looking for a happiness expert for, for your companies in the UK or in Europe, he's the man. And uh, the time is now yours. Thank you. And what I'll do is, is when um, Ilya speaks, I'll, I'll do an introduction to him. So as I've said, hopefully this will work. Um, so what I've done is I've put it onto Facebook Live, I'll take those videos and put them onto YouTube. Um, I was thinking as well, it might be worth, if you would like, if you share your emails, because what we could do is connect with each other and, and sometimes that is a good way to stay in touch, ask people for um, advice and, and thoughts and, and just basically meet people who have a similar interest and, and passion to yourself. I think, if I've got this right, we've got a bit more time and flexibility than the program suggests. So I would like us to be as interactive as possible. I would like you to ask questions as you go. If there's something you're not sure about, if there's an example you could give, just check in and say, what about this? So I've been working in mental health since just before 2000. So gosh, nearly, nearly 20 years in a variety of roles. I'm currently working in a eating disorders unit. I am the, vet, um, I'm the clinical advisor of the Mountain Way Veterans Charity, which works with uh, individuals who've served in the armed forces and have suffered post-traumatic stress disorder. And we're very keen to turn post-traumatic stress disorder into post-traumatic growth. So it's about using these experiences that we have in life and finding like the nugget of gold, the thing that can give our life meaning. And I was having a conversation with my niece on um, Sunday and she was, she was struggling about some things. And one of the things I said to her, and I'm, I'm going to ask you the same question, if you think of all of the valuable lessons that you have learned in life, how many of them have come from pleasant experiences? If you think about the valuable lessons that you've learned in life about yourself and other people, how many of those have come from painful and distressing experiences? It's, it's kind of one of the funny things in life, isn't it? The good stuff that doesn't, or sorry, the good stuff that happens to us doesn't teach us much. It does, but it doesn't teach us. But it's those painful things. Now, I think that's a really important thing to hold on to because when we are in the middle of that pain, when we are in the middle of that struggling and that suffering, one of the things we can do is remember, do you know what? At the end of this, within all of this pain, within all of this distress, there is a nugget of gold. I just need to hold on to hope for long enough to get through the distress and find that nugget of gold. Does that make sense? And that's very much what the Smarter Life Growth Approach is about. It's about saying, do you know, we can't control what life gives us. We can't control other people. What we can control is our response to what life gives us, our response to other people. 
It can be difficult to have that control, though, because sometimes we don't have the skills to find that nugget of gold. So this is very much a skills-based approach. It's very much about saying there are a number of things that you can do, and we all have choices. And this is to empower you to make choices that lead to growth, well-being, and happiness. Make sense so far? OK, so that's. So what we're going to talk about today is presentation outline. I'll introduce the model. I'll talk about its origins, its application, some of the key elements, evaluation, some further development, and some examples. Please ask questions as we go through, and please, you know, kind of make this as informal as possible. Okay, so the Smarter Life Growth Approach skills people so they are more aware, reflective, and insightful, and gives them a range of skills so they have a choice. The first thing I think is really important is we have two things. We have to have awareness, insight, and reflection. And if you think about the insight type therapies, the therapies that help people develop insight, when I work with people in those insight-based approaches, one of the things they might say to me is, I get that, but so what? What do I do with it? That leads to the skills-based approaches where you can do something. And when I work with people in just a skills-based approach, what I found is they said, okay, I get what to do, but I don't understand why I'm doing it. I don't understand the reason why. I don't understand how I got here. So I discovered through trial and error that combining insight-based approaches with skills-based approaches made a really good intervention. People understood the what, the why, and the how. I went backwards, didn't I? Um, it's about taking wise action. So I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you have been distressed, depressed, anxious, worried, stressed, tired, hungry, and been overwhelmed by your emotions, and done things which afterwards you might go, I cannot believe I did that. Well, that was a really dumb thing to do. Yeah? And I'm going to guess, I put my hand up very highly for that one. We all have that ability to do very unhelpful things. I have met many, many people, and I include myself in this, in my professional life, in my personal life, who when they have been in emotional mind have done some very, very unhelpful things. I have never met anyone who, when they have been in a wise mind, has done anything harmful or destructive to themselves or others. They might do things that they regret. They might do things with hindsight that they think, gosh, I wish I hadn't done that. But they tend not to do harmful things. Were you going to? I was going to say that's emotional hijacking. Yeah. When you're emotionally hijacked under a lot of stress. We have all yeah. done things that we later regret. And I'm like, what was I thinking? Yeah. But when we're not emotionally hijacked, then we're able to make wiser choices in life. And emotions are, the, I think, the emotions are the key to it. And I think emotions are the thing that many therapies, and, and maybe CBT, really missed out. Because I think it's emotions that are the things that kind of pull us together and hold us together as people. And they're the things that kind of blow us apart. So they're kind of like the glue and the gunpowder. The approach aims is very, very simple. So when I introduce myself to my clients, I say, have you ever met a psychologist before? And they often say no. And I say, do you know what a psychologist does? And they say no. And I say, my job's very simple. Together, we are going to identify all of the things you are doing that are unhelpful. We are then going to identify the things that you are doing which are helpful. We are going to increase the helpful and decrease the unhelpful. That is my job as a psychologist. And again, remember just before we started the talk, I talked about reducing stigma. If I was to work with you and say, you have irrational thoughts, you have these, these terms that we use as therapists, it can be quite stigmatizing. But if I say to you, do you know what? You're doing things which are helpful. You're doing things which are unhelpful. We're going to increase the helpful, decrease the unhelpful. What does that do to stigma? Does that make it feel OK? Does that make you feel human? Hopefully it does. So, oopsie. All of you possibly familiar with 
specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-framed SMART goals. So what I did is I added into that, and I thought, what else is really important? Well, it is really important that we evaluate our progress, and we evaluate the process of change, because there's no point going off the road and waiting till you get somewhere to realize, why don't we make small, minor adjustments as we go along? You can only do that if you evaluate and you reflect upon things. Then, if, if, um, how many of you are from the UK? I haven't asked. So, a few of you. There's, there's, there, there is a, there's a saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. You heard of that? One of the things I discovered when working with people is we spent a lot of time focusing on what was wrong with them, what they needed to do in, to improve. So they were the goals. Then I kind of discovered that actually include in our goals the reason why we're doing it. Not just to remove depression, remove anxiety, remove stress, but why don't we create goals to include the things that we love and we are passionate about. Why don't we include things that we are interested, that motivate us, that are meaningful to us? Make sure that we are always fair to ourselves, that we are kind, compassionate, but not only to ourselves, but to other people. And make sure we enjoy, sorry, make sure we do the things that we enjoy. So we have goals which are about removing distress, making things better, but we also have goals about improving well-being and happiness. In coaching, there is the GROW model. So that's a, I think it is Whitmore who talks about the GROW model. And have you heard of the GROW model of coaching? So, so the GROW model of coaching, it starts off with goals. And I thought, well, I can't use goals because I've already used goals. So I have to find a different G. So then I thought, okay, what is it? Well, I want the goals to be growth orientated. What we know about human beings is when you try, if you have two types of goals, one goal is to stop a certain behavior and another goal is to produce a certain behavior, people are much better at following the goals that produce a different type of behavior. Stopping behavior is not an effective goal. Does that make sense? So if you have a goal to stop eating unhealthily, that is not as effective as a goal to start eating healthily because it gives you a direction, it gives you a focus. So I changed goals to growth orientated. Again, they have to be realistic. Sometimes we can make the best goals, we can have the best ideas, but they're not realistic. We set ourselves up to failure and what we want is small incremental steps. We want to look for all of our options we want to look at the obstacles and once we have taken the obstacles out of the options we're left with opportunities what are the opportunities for growth what are the opportunities for me to do and to flourish to thrive to improve my well-being and happiness so g r o and w were the, were the grow models um, originally it was just options but i added ops then I thought, okay, so that's great. And clients started saying, yeah, okay, I get that. How? So then what we do with clients is we work on tactics. How are you going to do this? I believe human beings, and this is the analogy I give, I believe human beings are absolutely fantastic at creating problems. Look at the world around us. We are really good at creating problems. However, we have also been able to build the Sistine Chapel, the Eiffel Tower, paint the Mona Lisa, put a man on the moon, do heart surgery. We are also incredible problem solvers. So fortunately, we're really good at making problems, but we're also really good at solving problems. So one of the things I want people to do is to have a problem-solving approach. This is nothing more than a problem to solve. And you know what? If they can put a man on the moon, I can solve this problem. So it's about empowering people to tap into that human potential of problem-solving. Then the other thing is habit. 
How many of you have tried to make a change or worked with people who've tried to make a change and they come up with this brilliant plan, this really big, amazing change they're going to make? Anyone know people who do that? Yeah? What happens? Does it work or not work? Doesn't work. What works is small, consistent steps that build on each other and build on each other. And it's about habit. It's about doing one small thing every day. One small thing that improves, another small thing that improves. That's how you build sustainable change. So we want it to be a habit. Okay, so I work in what we call a trans-diagnostic, cross-diagnostic way. I don't believe that there is a model for depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorders, PTSD. I have never met a client who has come to me and said, I have depression and nothing else. My relationships are fine, my work is fine, my anxiety is fine, my sleep is fine. I've never met a client who's had one single problem. Have any of you worked with somebody or known somebody who has one single problem? Doesn't happen. So, oopsie, I jumped. So, over the years, this has been applied to, oh golly, Anxiety, depression, eating disorders, enhance, enhancing happiness, self-actualization, self-esteem, self-improvement, sports, stress, substance use, trauma, and work issues. It teaches a basic set of skills that can be applied across situations. Because what I want to do with people is I want to empower them to have a set of skills that they can apply to any situation life throws at them. I do not want them to have to come back to me and say, Pat, can we have some more sessions, please? Because I'm facing a new problem. I want them to have the ability to say, do you know what? I used these skills to deal with this problem. I am now going to problem solve. How can these skills help me with this problem? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. It draws on a number of theoretical approaches. So in a way, I'm quite fortunate. My, my PhD was in applied memory, so I have a very passionate interest about memory and learning. I then did clinical psychology. I found that that gave me good skills, but it didn't cover everything. So I went off and I did an MSc in positive psychology and coaching. And I thought, that's really good, but it still leaves me some gaps. So I did DBT, CAT, schema, did lots of, of different types of training. Discovered John Maxwell, the, the American coach, and really liked what he was saying. And what I liked about him is I could read his work and I could put a parallel column with all of the psychological references and evidence base. But what he did is he explained it in English. And one of the things I discovered is I was very good at explaining things at an academic intellectual level, but people don't work on an academic intellectual level. What level do they work on? Their heart. And what he did, and he does, in my opinion, he does brilliantly, is he explains it in a way where it goes, yeah, I get that. So I kind of looked at how he did it. Oops, sorry. It looks at the whole person. So the biological, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual. And do you remember I said one small step? So let's imagine I worked with all of you now, and you were feeling very overwhelmed, and I said, look, I'm gonna get a 1% improvement. Do you reckon you could all make a 1% improvement? So we're going to get a 1% improvement in your biological well-being. So sleep, diet, routine, physical activity. Then I'm going to get a 1% increase in your psychological well-being, your use of your strength, your problem-solving ability, your ability to manage your thoughts. So now we are at 2%. Then I'm going to say, let's look at your relationships. Let's look at your work, let's look at your relationships. Let's make a 1% improvement there. We're on now 3%. Let's look at your spiritual, your sense of meaning, your sense of purpose, your sense of doing something that is bigger than you, and I want 1%. So now, very quickly, we've got 4%. So that 4% goes up, and then next week I'm going to do 1%, but I've already gone up 4 Anyone good at maths? I try to work this out. So let's say I start with 5%, and I do 1% in those four areas, I'm on 9%. I'm then gonna do 1% of nine in four areas. And this is where my head just went, I don't do maths. 
But do you know what I mean? It's going to be a cumulative building up of one small step at a time. And I think if you extend, even if you do 1% change in your life today, if you extend that by 365 days, where you'll end up being in 365 days will be here. It won't be like right next to yeah. the, where you are right yeah. now. Because as those habits take form, you're going to be in a whole different place than you are right now. Yeah. And that's one of the things I think people often don't realize when they change. If you go into the change process here, thinking, this is where I want to be, what happens when you get halfway through and you think, do you know what? I don't want to be there, I want to be there. But you're still stuck with the opinion that you had there. Does that make sense? I worked with this guy, he was a really nice lad, absolutely loved him. And we were talking about he very sense of stress, depression, and anxiety. We knew what it was. He was doing a job and was involved in a job that he hated and really didn't want to do. And all of the work we were doing was kind of skirting around the things. The real thing was, I'm actually on this pathway here, which I decided when I was 16, 17. I'm now in my 20s, and it's not where I want to be. But if I keep doing it, I'm just going to keep being unhappy. So the big step was, how do I get off that and create a new pathway? Make sense? So that's why I think constant evaluation and eva uh, sorry, evaluation and reflection are important because we change. Um, teaches practical problem-solving skills. So that's the example. So I just took this because it's obviously depression and anxiety. Sorry, depression and stress we're talking about for this conference. Depression, frustration, sadness, worthlessness, irritability. Anxiety, trembling, increased heart rate, feeling nervous, overlap, restless, excessive worry, agitation. I've never worked with somebody who has just had stress, who has just had anxiety, who has just had depression. So what we want to do is an approach that encompasses all of that. So it's cross-diagnostic, it's transfunctional, it's problem-solution focus that it works across presentations. So. It empowers people because change is within their power and their authority. So all of us as human beings have the ability to change, to make choices. We also have the right to make choices. We have the right to make decisions. And I have the right to make choices and decisions which you may not agree are wise or healthy. But I have that right. Does that make sense? So in the UK, when we work with people, Mental capacity is a really big thing. People have the right and the capacity to make decision, decisions which we may not agree with. I personally draw the line when I make a decision that impacts on other people's well-being and happiness. And when I make a decision that impacts on my own well-being and happiness, I think we do have a right to challenge that in people. But we all have rights. It facilitates, it says, and it makes change possible by enabling people to give them the choice. Our actions and reactions are the conduit between our internal and our external world. So my internal reality is what happens inside me, and that is demonstrated and enacted by how I interact with other people. How you interact with me then changes my internal reality. So that is the important part. It's our actions where the internal and the external meet. So, one of the things, do you remember in New York, when I first met Ilya, I was doing this presentation, a very similar presentation, and I was talking about bodily sensations, emotions, actions, and thoughts. And I jokingly said, I need an acronym for this because I can't think what it is. And it wasn't called this at the time, I think it was called body sensations, it's something else. Anyway, and we joked about this, and I came home and I discovered my acronym. Bodily sensations, emotions, actions, and thoughts. How many of you are aware of Christine Podesky's hot cross bun in CBT? Thoughts, I can't remember what it is. Thoughts, behaviors, internal sensations, and emotions. And I thought, no, do you know what? I want people to march to the beat of their own drum. And marching to the beat of your own drum means being aware of your bodily sensations, being aware of your emotions, being aware of your actions, being aware of your thoughts, and that gets you to march to the beat of your own drum. So, you can have a helpful thought, a manageable emotion, a manageable pleasant body sensation, wise action, outcome of the action leads to a helpful thought. So you can create upward 
virtuous cycles. You can equally create unhelpful, vicious cycles. And it happens like this. It happens in a second. And there's a very good reason for that. We have got millions and millions of years of evolution have designed us to have safety first. If my body feels in threat and in danger, and I do fight, flight, freeze, and appease, if there is no danger, I'm still alive. And it's, hey, do you know what? No problem. If I haven't acted, and there is danger, I die. Does that make sense? Our biology has a predisposition and a natural tendency to err on the side of caution. Ilya and I both work with happiness. Shall I tell you the other unpleasant thing about evolution? What do you think evolution's take on happiness is? Evolution doesn't like happiness. <laughs> what would happen if 100,000 years ago we were all sitting, I'm going to be very flippant, just because I like it. So we're all sitting in caves 100,000 years ago, dinosaurs chomping around, and we're all sitting around going, do you know what, I'm really happy with life. <laughs> I'm not going to change. I'm not going to invent anything. I'm not going to discover what's over that hill, what's over that ocean, because I'm happy. I'm not going to do anything. Evolution does not like happiness. Do you agree with me? Yes. Yeah. I'm really, I was worried about saying that. So we know that when we try to improve well-being, happiness, removing stress and depression, we have a biological million of years evolution that predisposes to something. So do we work with a system or against it? We work with it. We know that that's how our biology works. We know that's what evolution works. So we work with it. We don't try and beat the system. You, anyone try to beat the system? Anyone here try to beat the system and won? No. No, no one ever beats the system. We're not going to beat evolution. So we work with it. We know how it works. Okay. I also have another theory. How many of you at school, or do, do you work with clinicians, do you work with clients, all of you? Or have an interest in mental health and, okay. Think of somebody you know who has drug, substance, misuse, self-harm, depression, anxiety. Just imagine that person in your mind. Do you think they were at school and the teacher said, what would you like to be when you grow up? And do you think they sat there and thought, oh, when I grow up, I want to have depression, anxiety, self-harm, eating disorder, trauma. I want to have a substance misuse and I want to use alcohol and have a gambling problem. Do you think people made that choice? No one makes that choice, but that choice is often what happens. Do, do you agree with that? One of the things I get really annoyed, have you ever heard people say with an eating disorder, with self-harm, with drugs, alcohol, homeless people, have you ever heard someone say, well, it's their choice? Have you heard people say that? Do you honestly believe people would make that choice if they had a choice? Do you think people would choose that life? I personally don't. I think we choose it because we have what's called a Hobson's choice. I'm not sure if this is an English expert. Have you heard of a Hobson's choice? So, many, many years ago in the day, days of horses, my horse riding, and stagecoaches, there was an innkeeper called Hobson. And you used to get to your pub, you would get yourself some food, you would change horses. And Hobson would say to you, you can have any horse you like, as long as it's the horse closest to the door. That's the only horse you can have. But you can have any horse you have, but that's the only horse you can have. Henry Ford, you can have any color you want, as long as it's black. So when people go and get into a position where there's depression, there's anxiety, there's drug use, there's self-harm, they don't have a choice. They are behaving in a way that makes sense to them in that moment. What I want to do is say you only have a choice if you have alternatives to choose from. My job as a psychologist, my job as a consultant, expert in happiness or well-being, whatever it is, is to empower you to have choice. Because if you do not have choice, you cannot choose. And that's really obvious, isn't it? But people don't kind of think about that. Okay, people do not choose to be unhappy, self-harm, 
be abused, use substances, suffer, struggle. This happens because they feel there's no other options available to them. So what we do, we move from unaware to aware to planning to wise action to outcome. And this bit here, awareness and planning is our internal world and our external world is when we act and the outcome of that action. Oops. What we have is we have two choices. If it works, top one, we're in a new place and we start the process again and we keep moving forward. If it doesn't work, it's not become a sustainable habit, did not achieve the desired result, we find a different way. It's always gonna be heads I win, tails you lose. If it works, great, we're gonna move on. If it doesn't work, great, got another opportunity to problem solve and find out what will work. I'll kind of jump ahead. So we have a range of human experiences. So we have the pleasant growth facilitating on that side, the unpleasant growth inhibiting, inhibiting on that side, and we're on a continuum, and we move up and down that continuum. Because we are unique, because no one approach has all the answers, Smarter Life Growth integrates a number of different approaches. It's an integrative approach. So one of the easiest ways to describe it is an integrative CBT approach. If you were to look at it, it would be very similar to DBT, Schema, CAT, and all of those other approaches. I haven't invented anything new. I've just pulled things together and created a structure which I think works and people are finding helpful. If you think of all of the different theoretical approaches out there, they have an area where they can work quite well on and a little tiny bit where they're really, really good. And that's the same with us as people. There's a range of things that I'm okay at doing, but there's some things I'm really good at doing. And this isn't a new idea. This George Kelly was talking about this. 1958, he's talked about the range and focus of convenience. So, the different approaches that I read and have used and pulled together, I won't read them all, but on the, this side here, you have the common factors. You're all aware of the common factors? So in therapy, the interesting thing about therapy is no therapeutic approach is significantly better than any other therapeutic approach. What works is the common factors, and the person's belief that what they're doing will help somebody else, and the other person's belief that what is being done will help them. But exceptions and commitment, cognitive analytical therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, compassionate based therapy, gestalt therapy, um, humanistic, meaning, Frankel, positive psychology, and young. What I found really, really interesting, have you, you know like the big names in therapy? Carl Rogers, 1950s, Fritz Perls, Albert Ellis, writing in the 50s and the 60s. If you go back and read what they were writing and saying in the 1950s and 60s to what we're saying in 2020, 2019, how different do you think it is? No, they're saying the same thing. We have been saying the same thing. We know the common factors. So why don't we focus on the common factors and teach people about them and empower them? So, all of us have a potential. All of us have an ideal. That's what I would ideally like to be. That's my potential. That's where I actually am. The closer I can get my potential, my ideal, and my actual, the best possible version of me I'm going to be. Best possible version of me I am. The more resilient I am the happier I am, the less stressed I am. The further my ideal, real, and actual self are, I love the word discombobulated. Have you heard that word? Discombobulated. The more discombobulated I am, the more separate my parts of myself are, the unhappier I'm gonna be. So let's work in a way to integrate ourselves into a coherent sense of self. So, it started in 1993. Um, I first became interested in transfunctional approaches when I was an undergraduate and I just remember our lecturer talking about how they did signal detection theory during the Second World War. So what they discovered is U-boats were spotted in the first 15 minutes of a, sh um, a watch 
and the last 15 minutes of a watch. And they knew that U-boats don't come up and go down when people are on watch. What they did is they took this finding out to the Applied Research Unit in Cambridge, and they made people look at a screen, and they had to detect dots, signal detection theory. So you've got a number of different choices. False positives, hits, and, and misses. Then they took it back to the ships and found out it didn't work, they went back. So what they discovered is human, atten human, human attention is a, has a transfunctional, doesn't matter what you're doing, it's about 50, 45 minutes. And the first 15 minutes you're really focused, the middle bit you're a bit bored, last 15 minutes you're going, oh I finished soon, so you switch back on. Um, right, the way it works, stabilization, sorry, safety and risk, stabilization and growth. The approach taken, we want to combine the parts and the whole. We want to make it specific and measurable. We don't want to base it on diagnosis for stigma and we want to increase the ability, the individual's ability to self-monitor. When you look at it, if I compare the outcomes I've got for this approach with the core, which is the clinical outcome routine evaluation, which is a standard mental health measure, there's a very <coughs> nice correlation. So what I'm going to do is, what we create is a formulation. So we talk about people's past experiences, how they interpret that, how their bodily sensations, emotions, actions and thoughts combine, and it creates this connection between the parts and the whole. The top bit, I've already said, is about insight. The bottom bit is about skills. So that's what, we, that's what it looks like. We talk about the spiky, uncomfortable feeling, and the reason I talk about a spiky, uncomfortable feeling is if it was nice and smooth, you'd hold it, you'd sit with it, you'd put it in your pocket, it wouldn't bother you. But because it's spiky, it's unpleasant, so you avoid it, you escape it. And those spikes go into well-being, your happiness, your goals, your friendships. They, they kind of just seep into all parts of you. So, we have different analogies, the idea that Two wolves you can feed. Heard the story about two wolves you can feed? So a grandfather's talking to his child and says there's two, he, there's great battle raging between two wolves. He doesn't know which one's going to win. One is full of anger, hatred. The other one's love and compassion. And the grandson says, wow, which one's going to win? The grandfather says, the one which I feed. So this is what it looks like. And part of the work we do as clinicians is taking something which is very, very chaotic and confusing. So this is what it, when it gets drawn up, this is what it looks like. People talk about stuff. They talk about having a meltdown. They talk about, I'm not worth it. Their body sensation, vomiting, increased sensitivity to touch, actions, more talkative, um, more scripted, emotion, shock. What we then do is we do this in a way that makes sense, because now I can take a big, overwhelming mess, and I can break it down. And once I've broken it down like this, all we need to do is have different skills. So this is an example from childhood trauma. That's an example from PTSD. That's an example of low mood and anxiety. That's an example of complex trauma. There's a template that people have, so they can do this themselves. They can fill in the past and future experiences, or past experiences, future predictions, the thing that's triggered them, the uncomfortable spike, the bodies, bodily sensation, emotion, action, and thoughts. They can focus on their biological, psychological, social, and spiritual resource capital. And then importantly, here, they've got ways in which they can break the cycle. And there's a list of skills that I give people and we work through. So some of the things we encourage people to invest. So we want them to improve. So invest in yourself, find the nugget of gold, which I talked about earlier. Follow your passion. Get up when you stumble, follow your blisters. Openness, try new things. Values, stick to your values. Engagement, connect to what you do. We talk about brimming with serenity. Breathing, relaxation, imagery, mindfulness, self-soothing. So we have the broom with serenity and improve, and you can either use these skills to decrease the unhelpful 
or increase their helpful. The same skills are applied across situation. The only thing depends on what you want to achieve with using the skills. But the skills are the same. We talk about reasonable, emotional and wise mind. We talk about awareness, reflection and insight. We talk about expansive, constrictive and bare attention. Some, I'll finish on the final workbook skills. So we talk about stop, stop, take a step back, observe, pull back and problem solve. Think about if you're hungry, angry, low in mood, tired and stressed. Soften your approach, smile, open, face forward. Remember you'll use a pleasant tone, eye contact and nod. Listen with honesty, empathy, acceptance and respect. Describe how you're feeling, so I describe what's happening, express how you're feeling, state your objectives, be willing to compromise, reinforce, investigate the possibilities, remember your body language, and use an easy and gentle manner. That is the progress that people make over eight sessions. That's the comparison to the core. I think I went on, I got lots of hand signals to finish, so I'm very sorry, I think I went on no, you're okay. fine. You're good. You still have three or four minutes. I have three, four, I have, right, I have three or four minutes. Let's go back and do yes. some more. Okay. There are lots of acronyms. I've discovered I love acronyms. I love acronyms. Um, you don't have to, people don't have to remember the acronyms, but it's just there as a simple way to say, do you know what? What can I do to improve the moment? And even if they say, invest in yourself, find meaning, they can remember too. It's there. But the idea is just to make this as easy. And this probably comes... From, do you remember I said my first PhD was in applied memory and um, cognition? So I probably have a fascination with how our memory works. Acronyms, they do work. Although I often remember the acronym and then forget the letters, but anyway. Okay, so at the moment, um, the Smart Life Growth book is, I'm just saying this, um, I feel it's a bit of a plug, but it's kind of not because there isn't actually a book yet. It's with an editor, and that there's a workbook at the moment. So the hope is to have this as a workbook and a textbook that people can kind of fill themselves. And the idea that I want to do is I want to do it as a social enterprise, so it's a non-profit book. So basically, it's there and it's available. Because my other discovery is lots of people cannot afford to access services to improve well-being and happiness. Um, Okay, so any questions? I feel like I've talked at you for... Hi. Hello, uh, just a little comment or adding to your acronyms. Uh, on the list it is that we have a hold acronym, which means that you just step back when you are hungry, angry, late and tired. So I'm not, I'm not the only one who, who likes acronyms. The hold one is a common one, isn't it? And there's also BLAST, which is bored, lonely, angry, stressed, and tired. But I couldn't make BLAST fit into there, so I had to kind of, but yeah, acronyms. Anyone else like acronyms? Oh, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Do you have the, any of these things available? Uh, like a handout that you might give a patient with the, uh, the spiky emotions? There. That one. Yeah. Um, I did post that onto um, LinkedIn, so I think it is there. Um, but if not, I, I can send it to you. I see. Okay. Because what I do is I, I draw this out with people as we talk, so we just draw it all out. The reason I do that is because when you, and I did skip this one, our emotions are our limbic system down there. When we draw things out, we have to engage the thinking and logical parts. Just where he's going to stop me talking. No, so drawing <laughs> things out makes you engage the logical part, the reasoning part, and dampens down. So I draw it out with them, and basically we then create one like that, which is their own version, and then they have templates. But if, if you want, I can send you that, because I've, I've got all of that. And, I mean, it's on this laptop here, so I, I can do that today. And anyone else who wants to, I'm more than happy to, to share these and try them. And you can say to me, do you know what? It doesn't work because of this. It does work because of this because I'm happy to take feedback. But, yeah, I have all of, the, all of them as handouts. Um, and the idea is that people can go away. And people can learn how to draw that themselves. 
really quickly because they know bubble, spike, square. That's all they have to do. Any other questions? Thank you so much.